1940, there was a restaurant in San Bernardino, California that revolutionized the fast food industry. Some of you might be there with me. McDonald's, the McDonald's brothers, Richard, and I think his, the other brother's name, Maurice McDonald, set up what's called McDonald's. It was called McDonald's when it was there. And what they did was they revolutionized the fast food industry because they added something that they coined uh, and called the speedy service system. Okay, the speedy service system. And this was something that they developed over a long period of time that was modeled after Henry Ford's uh, uh, assembly line, right? So they added that into their small, I mean, smaller than this, this room sized restaurant that they had out there. And if you remember, before the McDonald brothers, dine-in restaurants were really, that was, that was the hot thing in restaurant uh, at the time. But this revolutionized that and kind of pushed dine-in out the window. Because what they did was they made it so as soon as a customer would order at the front, that the system that they put in place, they get their order within the next 30 seconds, right? And to us, we look at that and it's like, that's 30 seconds, that's a long time, right? It's like, what are you talking about, 30 seconds? Well, to them, that was a revolutionary experience. That was a revolutionary thing. Um, and the, the reason why that worked and it functioned so properly is because everybody had a role, right? Everybody knew what they were supposed to do. They played their part, they played their role, and then it worked perfectly. It worked seamlessly, right? Well, the Christian family unit is, is very similar to a system that's put in place where everybody has a role, a purpose, everyone has to be uh, uh, strategically placed and everyone has to follow their, their role and has to follow their part and every person is, is connected in some way and if somebody is, is disconnected in any way, then it, it kind of fails, right? The whole system falls apart and it kind of crumbles. So we all have this, this part to play. Sometimes when we neglect or take for granted those family relationships or those roles that we, the God-ordained roles that have been given to us, then it all falls apart and it fails. Go to Colossians 3. We're looking at verses 18 and we're going all the way to chapter 4, verse 1. Colossians 3, verse 18. We're going to 4, verse 1. And we see Paul addressing now the Christian households in Colossae. And I want you to first actually look at verse 17, because it gives us context for why he's saying what he's saying, right? If you remember, if you've been with us, Paul just got done talking about uh, having an eternal perspective, right? Putting off the old ways of sin and putting on the new ways of Jesus Christ in living in righteousness, having an eternal perspective and, and foregoing this temporal mindset of dealing with things in, in, in this life and focusing on living for the next life. And then he goes on to address, okay, more practically, let's talk about the families. Let's talk about the Christian households. So starting in actually verse 17, I want you to get the context for why he says this. In verse 17, he says, And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So there's this idea, of course, as we talked about last week, glorifying God in everything you do. And then Paul goes on to say, okay, so if we're called to glorify God with everything we do, then the Christian households are responsible to be submissive to God, to be in submission to God. Therefore, these roles that we're putting in place have purpose, have meaning. So let's look at it. Verse 18. Wives, submit to your husbands, as is fitting to the Lord. Okay, right out of the gate, we think, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> what are you talking about? Whoa, 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 submit to your husbands. Come on. Right? No, this is not some type of dictatorship submission, right? This is a, 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 an agreed upon, a willing submission to the husband. And in the Bible, it's actually compared to the Holy Spirit as a helper, right? The wife is a helper of the husband in the family unit. And it's a good submission. You know, we hear submission in our society and we think this is a bad thing. Bad, 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 bad. No, this is a good thing. In fact, we'll look at Ephesians 5, which helps us understand this a little bit more uh, uh, detailed. But this is a good thing that God has ordained for, for women to be a part of the role of the family, right? This is, this is not a, a, a negative aspect. Let's, let's hold it till, till later, Asha. It, it was very much connected to this, that's all. Yeah, but let's talk about it after. Let's talk about it after. Because I want to keep going. I want to keep talking about it. Um, 
Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Okay, so now husbands have this, uh, this uh, job, this role that they have to play. Husbands, love your wives. Oh, that seems simple, right? Just love your wives and wives have to submit to the husbands? Okay, we'll talk about why that's not as simple as it, as it states, okay? Not because of the wife. Okay. <laughs> I'm not saying that because wives are hard to love. That's not why I'm saying that. Oh, man. Oh. I'm saying, you know, now I have to say, I'm saying that because Jesus tells us that it's like Jesus loving the church, right? And the comparison is, is incredibly hard for, for husbands to do. Okay. But we'll talk about Ephesians 5 in the sermon. Okay. Wives, you are very easy to love, okay? <laughs> children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. So children have this role and this uh, responsibility in the family unit, to obey their parents. Which means, as verse 21 is going to talk about, that parents have a, a leadership role over the, the children. Verse 21, fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Right? So in the, the, the Colossian uh, family unit, the fathers had a tendency to utilize their strength and their vo vocal cords to assert some type of dominance over their children and over their wives. And that's why Paul's saying, hey, look, that's not what Christian households are all about. Right? And he goes on to say, uh, don't provoke them. And the idea is don't cause them to be exasperated. Don't cause them to feel like they cannot please you. Don't cause them to feel like this is impossible to, to try to please my, my parents, right? Verse 22, bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. Now, this is it. This is you. Bond servants translates literally to slaves. Slaves, okay? So in this ancient context, this is not Paul uh, condoning slavery. This is simply Paul saying, look, in the context of ancient Colossae, there was slavery. There was a master and servant bond, uh, a, a partnership. However, I say partnership strategically because it's the slavery that was done then is much different than what we have in our mind in, in, is chattel slavery, right? Man stealing. That is prohibited clearly in scripture. What we're dealing with here is probably a guy who, uh, a servant who owed somebody else money but couldn't pay it. So what he did was instead of sending him to prison, he said, hey, I'll forgive you. You just got to work for me for the next year. Work off the debt, right? Is that a hireling type of thing? Yeah, it, it could be something like that, right? Like it, really what it is, is it's an employee-employer relationship, right? That's kind of the context comparison to what we're dealing with today, right? So Paul's saying, look, even the relationships within the family unit, as in master and, and servant, need to be good and solid and, and, and you know, caring for one another. So the bond servant, he addresses first, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers. So what they were doing was they, uh, the, the, the servants in Colossae, what they were doing was they were only working hard when they knew their master was watching, right? <laughs> and, and there was a tendency to do that because because they weren't getting paid for their work, right? It wasn't like a paid labor. They were really just paying off a debt. So they would kind of take advantage of, of the situation. They'd take advantage of their time and they would take advantage of their work. It goes on. But with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Because who always sees the Christian's work ethic? God, right? So Paul's saying, look, your earthly master may not see it, but you know who does see it? God. And that's where he goes on to talk about here. That's the context of this verse 23 and 24 and 25. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. So he's saying, look, you have eternal rewards to look forward to. You may not be blessed temporarily right now in this, in this earthly life, but you know what you will be blessed in? If you work hard for your masters and for the Lord, you will be blessed eternally. There's eternal rewards and inheritance that these Colossian uh, servants got to look forward to. Verse 25, For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. And then verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 1, Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly 
knowing that you also have a master in heaven. So even the relationship between master and servant is reconciled under the umbrella of Christianity, under the umbrella of Christ. So all of these relationships within the household are so important and so vital with Jesus being the head of the relationship, or the, the household rather. Jesus is the primary person that we're all seeking to, to please and honor with our lives. So the main point that I want you to pull out of this is I want you to practice righteousness in all of your family relationships, right? Remembering that Jesus, he's the head of the relationship. So that should drive all of your motivation. That should drive all of the types of uh, conversations and, and uh, uh, how you invest your time with relationships with other people. It's all because you're trying to serve Jesus. You might notice, as you think about this text that talks about the family unit, which most of you in this room don't have the, the standard family unit anymore. What I mean by that is it's not like young parents right, with young children, who that's who Paul's addressing when he's talking about the children. He's talking about young, small children, right? And then it talks about work, which a lot of us here are retired, right? Or maybe you have a different type of work situation. <laughs> you have a different type of work situation now instead of a full-time time career, right? So you, you may think, okay, there's a difficulty here. Well, how, how do we apply this? Well, Here's the thing, the way we can apply this is you have to remember that you're, you, you can be a great example mm -hmm. of righteousness to your family unit, right? For a lot of you, you're, you're kind of at the top of the hierarchy of your family. You're the matriarchs, you're the patriarchs of your family, if you will, right? And people are looking to you as an example. So that's point number one. I want you to be a righteous example for your family, right? When you think about verses 18 to 21, you think about how Paul's trying to show us, look, these relationships, these relationships that you have within your family, they're all a means of, of, of growing in righteousness. They're all a means of being an example to, to your family. I mean, you know, the wives have a role, the husbands have a role, children have a role, fathers have a, uh, have a role not to uh, overburden their, their children, fathers and mothers, really. It's a good thing for all of you to do is to be that righteous example to your family. Because... Frankly, we're seeing a degradation in the family unit in our culture, right? This, we, can't, we can't go further in this text talking about family without addressing the obvious, the elephant in the room, that we're seeing a degradation, sadly, in the culture that we live in of the family unit, right? We're seeing people reject these type of, of clear commands in Scripture. I mean, the family started with God, Adam and Eve, right? And then they had children, and that was the plan, but then it all fell apart, right? And then they, they, but they still, they had children. There was a hierarchy always looking towards God. So it's God, right? Christ, man, wife, children. This, this is a, a family structure, a family unit that, that is being degraded in our culture for many reasons. And the first one that I thought of when I was thinking about this, it, it's divorce. Sadly, divorce is on, on a rise. I mean, there, it's, you're more likely to get divorced and not get divorced anymore in this culture. And that's because it's, it, it's less because people are having issues. Everyone in marriage has problems and you resolve the problems, but it's more so nowadays that they're looking at it as this is just a simple, you know, I can just break up with this person, right? There's no responsibility, no value of that marriage covenant, no value of, of, the, of the family unit, which, which then plays out itself in, in children. Right? People are, are re rejecting having children, which is a command from God to do, to be fruitful and multiply. And they're doing it not, you know, not because they can't have children or anything like that, but be because they, they say, you know what, I'd rather spend my money on myself and, and nobody else and isolate themselves from even their families. They'd rather just do their own thing. We're seeing a degradation of the family unit. I mean, even drug use is on the rise within family units. Fatherlessness is on the rise within family units all over the place. I mean, when the father, when there's no father in the family, I mean, biblically speaking, there's a spiritual component to this. Whether or not you agree with scripture, there's a, it's a fact. And there's a spiritual component tied to this that the father, when there's a, not a father in the household, we don't have a, a leader, if you will, in the household. However, if the father dies, of course, the mom can step in and do her thing, and God blesses that. However, fathers are not stepping up 
in this culture. In fact, they're abandoned, they're running away. In many ways, fatherlessness can also be played out in how a father who is there and present in the home still doesn't man up and do what he needs to do. I mean, there's, that's a problem in the family unit, in our culture. The value God places on family is just, it's being mocked. It's being rejected. It's being despised in our culture. And it's sad to see. It's sad to see. And you see the degradation happen, right? And my, my, my plea with you, if you will, is be an example of righteousness to your family units. Whether it be your direct family or your extended family, everyone, you have wisdom beyond uh, years that they have. You can pour into them and tell them, hey, look, this is what works. This is what doesn't work. Right? You can be a model of Christ-likeness, which we'll talk about later. You could be the, the glue that bonds uh, families, uh, you know, family units within your, your big family unit uh, from degrading. Right? You can be that person that does that. Every family unit has those roles that each person plays, as we addressed already as I was ex exegeting the text. But turn with me to Ephesians 5. That's the text I wanted you to see. Ephesians 5. Maybe you'll have a little bit more sympathy for the husband here. <laughs> Ephesians 5. Okay. Ephesians 5, starting in verse 22. Starting in verse 22. We're going to look first at... First, at, actually, let me rephrase that. First, look at verse 23, because that's the first point I want to make about this. Is For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. So Christ is the head, right? So we see this established hierarchy within the family unit, which should dictate every uh, aspect of your family. How husbands relate to wives, how wives relate to husbands, how kids relate to their parents, how parents relate to their children. If we don't have Christ as the head, then yes, of course, the degradation of the family is going to happen, right? Because you're living for yourself or you're living for something else. You're not living for the glory of Christ. Husband, in Ephesians 5.25. Love your wives, doesn't stop there, as Christ <laughs> loved the church and gave himself up for her. You, husband, have a standard that you cannot achieve. Frankly, you can't, you, right? So wives, you know, it's like, oh man, it's hard to submit to my husband. Okay, well, husbands are told to love their wives as Christ Jesus, who died for the church, loves the church. That's, that's a difficult thing to do. However, husbands, let me help you with this practice. You got to love your wife carelessly. Care, carefully. Carefully. <laughs> Care fully. Please don't love your wife carelessly. Please love your wife carefully. Oh, man. Love your wife carefully. Okay? And that takes intentionality, right? That takes patience. That takes sacrifice, which is another. Love your wife sacrificially. Which oftentimes, as husbands, we think that we're loving our wives sacrificially and we're loving them carefully. But really, we haven't asked them how they want to be loved carefully, how they want to be loved sacrificially. We don't know what's a sacrifice to them. We just think it's a sacrifice to us, so I must be loving my wife sacrificially. Well, no, that's not the case. And do not be harsh with your wife. Do not be harsh, right? Don't use your, your voice or your power or your strength to somehow push your wife into submission. She's going to do her role just fine. We don't need to do that as, as husbands. <laughs> husbands, did you know that whether or not God answers your prayers is reliance upon how you treat your wife? 1 Peter 3, verse 7. 1 Peter 3, verse 7 says, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. They're equal with you under Christ. You, of course, there's a hierarchy, but they're equal in value. And then it goes on. 
so that your prayers may not be hindered. So husbands, whether or not God answers your prayers in the way that you would hope he'd answer your prayers depends on how you're treating your wife. We have to be careful as husbands. We have to fill this role. And look, I know, you know, and as, as I go through this, some of you may not have a spouse right now, or some of you are widowed, but, but you can take these examples. If you're a husband, or a man, rather, that's, that's widowed, or not a, don't, don't, you don't have a spouse, you can learn these examples and, and be that example to your family unit, right? You can teach those, uh, the people, the men in your family, how to do these things, right? Now, wives, back in Ephesians 5, Ephesians 5, it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Right? Submitting to his leadership. Even if he's a bad leader. If he's a great leader, you have an easier job to submit. If he's a bad leader, great, that's fine too. Your job is still to submit. And to help them, and to care for them, and to come alongside them, and to encourage them. There, I mean, there's so much more that, that we can talk about with that, but being a helpful partner is, is, is it's vital in the family unit, right? We, we sometimes think that um, these roles are like offensive in some way, but, but they're not. I mean, even, even the Trinity has different duties and roles within it, right? Even the Trinity has these things where the, the son is willfully submitting to the father's will, right? Even though they're in agreement and they're equal and every and co-eternal, co right? They're all God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, God. But there's still different roles and, and jobs to play in this, this relationship. And God is, is trying to show us this is the right way to have a family unit. This is the right way to, uh, to build a, a family, to, to have a right Christian household, a well-oiled uh, Christian household. Okay, now children and grandchildren, Paul also addresses. Of course, all of you, all of us, we're all children, right? Right? Some of you have uh, children, some of you have grandchildren, okay? So in this sense, it's, you know, the direct application is, hey, obey your parents, right? Well, okay, well, that's a little bit hard for us to apply. But what we can apply, what you can apply, is teaching your children and your grandchildren how to obey their parents, right? Coming alongside your children and coming alongside their, their parents, if it's like an aunt or uncle or, or, or whoever it may be within your family unit, come alongside them and help them in their parenting process. I mean, you and I both know that that is desperately needed in our culture today. People, children, to be parented. I mean, the obedience of children to their parents, if they were good at that, we'd see a much different society than we live in today. And you can play a part in that. You can play a part in that. You can come alongside parents within your family unit and be an example of righteousness and help them and encourage them and model Christ to them. As I said, it, many of you are in a unique position where you're at the top of your family unit, if you will, right? The matriarchs, the patriarchs of your family. And you need to use that as an opportunity to model Christ's likeness to your family. So, like I mentioned, even if you are, uh, you know, a widow or you don't have a spouse or maybe you don't even have children, you have a family, right? There's, there's people in your life. And if you don't have a family, which is probably a minority of you, you have a church family, right? But let me focus on the people, they have family units, right? You can model Christ's likeness. I mean, think about how, what effect you can have on your family unit because most people are looking to the, the, the grandparents as, as an example, right? Most people are looking to the parents as an example uh, to set for the rest of the family, right? I mean, I even see it in my family where, you know, my, my grandparents aren't, aren't believers and therefore there's a lot of kids in our family that aren't believers, right? I mean, you guys set the bar for the rest of your family unit. So you, you need to be focused on modeling Christ's likeness to your family, you might have a temptation, though, to isolate from your family. I think, um, you know, living in uh, this area, this demographic, it's in this culture, it's, you know, it's really promoted to kind of isolate yourself and kind of do your own thing and, and not interact. And it's easy to just interact via social media or on a phone or something like that, right? 
Well, we can't be godly examples to our family if we try to isolate ourselves. Proverbs 18.1. Proverbs 18.1. It tells us why isolation is not a great thing. Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. It's selfish. He breaks out against all sound judgment. Proverbs 27.17. Iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. How can you be an iron sharpening person in your family if you're isolating yourself from the family? Even if there's, there's animosity and disagreements in your family. We talked last week about be, being a forgiving person and forgiving uh, people's wrongs. I mean, let's forgive that. Let's reconcile. Let's restore those broken relationships and start being an example to the family of Christ-likeness. We can't isolate if we're going to be an example of Christ-likeness to our family. Some of you are part of a family that are majority non-Christians. Mm -hmm. What a great opportunity for you to model Christ's likeness to those people. What a great opportunity for you to model righteousness and godly behavior and, of course, evangelize your family members. I mean, you can be the difference maker, not only in your family, but in the society that we live in today. It starts with the family. I mean, whenever you question, why is the culture going to where it is today? It's because it's it, the degradation of the family unit. That's where it all starts, right? And of course, that's because they reject God, right? But it starts there. And you can be a model of Christ's likeness to your non-Christian -fam non family members. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Write that verse down. I'll read it for you. Talking about being lights in this dark generation. Matthew 5, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You have a direct impact, your righteousness, to your non-safe family members. I mean, you'll open up opportunities and open up doors for the gospel by simply being a godly example to them in their, li in, in their lives. Some of you are part of a family of majority Christians, and you're thinking, how can I be a godly example to them? Well, not every Christian's great, right? Not every Christian is perfect. We all struggle in many ways. So why don't you take your knowledge and your wisdom and your Christ-likeness and disciple your family members? Even the ones you don't like that much. Right? Care for them. Love them. Pour into them. Pour into them. Develop and invest in those relationships. Take time to do that. You might be saying, like, you know, Pastor Roy, that's really hard to do. They don't really want to spend time. They don't want to hang out. Well, keep being persistent. Be persistent. Whatever way that you can kind of inch your way in and, and disciple and, and encourage and to grow to any, any opportunity that you have to get a family unit together. Share lunch, share a meal together. Invite them to church, right? Bring them to ministry events. Whatever you can do to get this, uh, these family units together and to exemplify Christ to them, yeah. right? Look back to our text in verse 22. Verse, uh, yeah, verse 22, chapter 3, verse 22. I want you to look afresh at what Paul says about work. What Paul says about work. Back in our text, he says, again, bond servants, obey in everything those who are earthly masters, right? And then he says, okay, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord. And then he says, masters, you also have a job in verse 1, chapter 4. Paul shifts his focus from relationships, direct relationships with the family unit, to relationships in work, right? And that's an application that I think you guys can draw from this, is whatever place that you're working... You can glorify Christ in that work. Demonstrate hard work for your family. That's point number two. Demonstrate hard work for your family. I don't know about you, but when I think of hard work, the first thing that comes to mind are Chick-fil-A workers. Do you guys like Chick-fil-A? Do you ever go through Chick-fil-A, the drive-thru or anything like that? And maybe this is maybe this is like not something that you're you're related to, but let me explain to you the work ethic 
of Chick-fil-A workers, right? They come up to you, they greet you, how's your day going? You know, you say, can I do the, I'm going to have a number one, please, you know, th thank you. My pleasure is how they respond. My pleasure. Right? I saw a video one time of a guy who forgot his drink at the window of a drive-thru. The Chick-fil-A worker in the rain ran out to the car and gave him his drink. He said, my pleasure. Right? These, are, these are hard workers. They have a work ethic that it seems to be unmatched in our society, right? And, and I think that's why Chick-fil-A is very successful, because people appreciate the experience that they have when they go there. Christians ought to work hard in this way, right? Show your family members, be an example, demonstrate, if you will, hard work to your family members. Because think about it, I, I keep referencing the culture because I think it's so relevant that we see this cultural drift away from desiring to work hard. We, we, we see a cultural drift away from, from people trying to kind of skate by and do the bare minimum and then get paid in, in excess because of it, right? We, we see this, this entitlement mentality that hard work would really put to death. And you can be an example to the young people in your families of hard work that is just escaping their entire livelihood, escaping their, their mentality I entirely. Roy, would you mind explaining at some point the phrase that we have at Compass, at a pat? Sure. Yeah, so at, but I've never heard anything really explain it, but yeah. it's good here. Yeah, at a pat, anything, any place, any time. That's an acronym, right? So that's that idea of you're, as a, as a disciple of Christ, in relation with other people in the church and really just in general, you're willing to do anything, you're willing to do it at any, at any place, and you're willing to do it at any time. And it's this mentality of being there for somebody all the time and, 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 and sacrificing them. I mean, this connects, like even you can think of uh, your family unit, uh, this connects with your roles, this connects with the family unit. Yeah, that's, that's what, you know, Compass has this idea of, of ADAPA. It's this acronym that we kind of stand by for our, our uh, you know, servant leaders and uh, um, people within the church. Yeah. Yeah, and that, you know, it ties in with demonstrating hard work. It is We need to be hard workers uh, for the family. Great. <laughs> Let's fix it. <laughs> yes, it's better than care. It's better than carelessly. Look at that. Demonstrate hard work for your family. All right. Yes, so we see this cultural drift. This cultural drift away from a desire to work hard. And you can be a model to your family units of working hard. And that's what Christians should be doing. We should be working hard. We should be hard workers. Think of the effect you'll have on your family if you model hard work. Now, I, I know for some of you, you're not working in a job, maybe. Uh, maybe you're working in, in some odd jobs. You're working in tasks. Some of you are working still full-time. Great. But one place that we all are working, at least we should be if we're calling ourselves Christians, is serving in our church, right? Let's not be lazy servants, right? <laughs> I mean, I mean, that's a great place where we can model hard work. Your family looks to you and sees, wow, they are going to a, a Bible study on Thursdays. They're going to church. They're serving in the church. Then they go to another midweek ministry. And then they're at my, their friend's house and having lunch. And they're having dinner over here. And they're doing... That should be you, right? I mean, that, I mean, not saying like, hey, do all of these things and, and, and make yourself overwhelmed in that. But my point is, is that your family can look to you and see, wow, I don't even work that hard. I don't even work like that, right? You can be a good model to your family of hard work. And that starts with maintaining a godly work ethic. You got to maintain a godly work ethic. Work with integrity and honesty. That's what verse 22 it, it makes us makes so clear. Is that he's saying, hey, don't work to be a people pleaser. Don't work for, for the sake of man just to make someone look happy because, no, no, that's a bad work ethic. You've got to work hard with integrity and honesty no matter what job you're doing, whether it be a, a service post or, or a job that you're doing um, you know, professionally. Work with sincerity. Knowing God is watching. That's what Paul addresses in verse 23 and 24. That God is, is watching over the work that you do. 
companies that come to mind for me is Amazon, Microsoft, Tesla, right? I mean, these are companies that started in garages. And these guys not only worked hard, they worked hard, they worked their tail off to get to where they are today, but these guys had a vision that was deeper than just simply the day-to-day -day task working hard. So for the Christian, when we, when we look at this text and we see uh, that we, we have to have a deeper uh, purpose, a deeper vision, in which we do, because as verse 17 reminds us and as verse 23 and 24 reminds us of, is that we need to be working for the glory of Christ. We have this deeper purpose, this deeper vision to make Christ known and simply to work because he calls us to work and it's a good thing. We want to please him. Of course, we want to please our boss or please our leader or whatever it may be, right? But ultimately, we're working hard because we want to please Jesus. I mean, I don't know about you, but that, that means that every Christian should probably be the hardest workers out of everybody else in the world. Because we're working for Jesus. The God of the universe is who you're working for. And he's pleased or displeased with how you work. That should draw us to be hard workers, more so than the person that's doing it for themselves, right? That's, that's the deeper vision that Christians ought to have, the deeper purpose. And as Paul mentions he, in, in verse 24 and 25, he's talking about eternal rewards and inheritance, right? 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, perhaps this is new to you, but we are working and we are rewarded for the good works that we do in heaven. And he says in verse 10, For we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Now, of course, if you're in Christ, if you're a Christian, you are uh, judged with, uh, for commendation, not condemnation. Right? But he still brings up the bad things. He says, hey, look like you could have done something. I don't know how it's going to go down. Right? But there's still... It's like, hey, check that, right? But the focus is, of course, look at the good that you've done. Look at the, here's you were obedient to me. You, you know, you fought the good fight. You worked hard. Here's here's eternal rewards. Now I don't know what that looks like. Maybe it's a second story house or something, a third story, a mansion. I don't know what that looks like in heaven. But it is practical in a sense, right? I don't know what eternal rewards look like. However, it's it's a great reminder to us to know that even God. I mean. I was just talking to my wife last night about, about this sermon and about this text. And I was, it, it, if God is saying, hey, this is a good reward that you will get, that I'm giving to you, the, the good gift giver, right? God's a great gift giver. I mean, you look out into the world and see all the good that, 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 that goes on and the beauty of nature and all of these good things that God provides us. And just in your practical life and the good things and the way he's, he's, he blesses you. And God's saying, hey, in heaven, where it's perfect and without sin, there's good rewards. And by the way, you want these rewards, so work for them in this life. That's coming from God. So to me, I'm like, this is a big deal. This is awesome. Like, are you following me there? Like, if God's saying that these gifts are good in heaven, right, when he's the good gift giver in this sinful world where these, these gifts that we have in here are are tainted and disrupted by sin, but we call them so good and they're great. Like, think about how great the, award, the rewards in heaven will be. That should motivate us to work hard. And God says, it's not a bad thing for you to want those rewards. You should be motivated by those. Go and work hard for those. Of course, we work for the glory of Christ, but that's also a good motivation is to work hard for those eternal rewards, which Paul wants us to remember as we consider our work ethic and we consider how to demonstrate hard work to our family. I mean, these are, these are things that our family needs to know. These are things that the people in our family need to, 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 to see. And, and only Christians understand this, right? Now, I mean, of course, it, people can understand this if you taught them to them, but they don't experience it the way that Christians do. Right? And, and, and they, they need to. They need to know these things. <clears throat> Ultimately, God desires a, a family to be strong. I mean, we can see all throughout Scripture the value and the importance that God puts on the family unit. I mean, we can, and again, we can see it, for the degradation of the family unit and all the problems that it causes in society. And you play a vital role in that. You play a vital role in the Christian family unit. 
through being an example of righteousness and demonstrating hard work, you can make God-glorifying, eternal impact for your family. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this reminder that relationships within the family are so important. And God, we know that they make a direct impact. And we pray, God, that you help us to be examples to our family unit. I know that's different in various degrees in the lives of the people that are in this room, but God, we pray that we can glorify you in what we do, modeling Christ-likeness, modeling righteousness, modeling hard work for your glory, God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.